Welcome back to another episode of the Good Question podcast by Coin Schedule TV. What do you think the, the UK can do? Do you think it's still legislative to try and incentivize uh, uh, London and the UK being a hub of crypto and uh, blockchain innovation? Well, again, I, yeah. um, I mean, you might want to answer this more eloquently than I do, but I, I mean, I. I I'm, I, I, look, I mean, I think if you want to be, if you, if you want to be the leader of innovation in a new technology, then you have to be flexible. You have to be fair. You have to be. You also have to have a level of understanding where things go wrong. You hit a brick wall. Don't just shove people in jail for that. Time to go left or right or whatever. It's it, it's really not rocket science, and 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 I, I just, and I think possibly because it's such huge legacy stuff that, that, that surrounds the, the laws in, 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 in the United Kingdom that maybe make it a bit sort of trying to navigate an oil tanker rather than a, you know, a, a jet ski. You know, it's, 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 it's that sort of analogy. Right? Mm. What, what do you think? I think they're doing a reasonably good job. Okay. I didn't think I would hear myself saying that, so I surprised myself. But if you think about um, how forward-thinking the FCA sandbox is mm. and how that's being utilized to gain real insights and open up you know the regulators to these real world the, the uh, understandings yeah. exactly mm. that's that's hugely powerful mm. so um you know there's not that many uh environments and countries that have done what the fca have done um in in terms of creating a sandbox that is um, taking those lessons learned and putting them into effect. Um, but, you know, going back to my kind of position about it, are the regulators doing enough for the institutional, you know, perspective, it's, an, it's a regulator's job to um, not just take the inputs from the powers that be and, and people who are influential and organizations mm. that are influential. It's their job to understand and move at an appropriate pace that may not be as fast as you know humans want it because humans want everything uh, you know quickly and especially with the advent of the internet that's become even more prevalent we're dealing with different dynamics we're dealing with humans we're dealing with the ecosystem and then we're dealing with legacy mm. so I think that was my fundamental point about the difference between the you know these small um, these small jurisdictions which absolutely you know, can 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 make decisions like let's have a meet up on Monday sure I mean yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just like a, it's just like the institutions right you have legacy institutions you have uh, institutions that are more nimble so ultimately we're not dealing with anything different there it's just the size of the situation and how you actually handle it and how you should handle it given the circumstances so from my perspective you know we we're speaking about uh, chucking people in jail for, for not doing the right thing according to the frameworks of, of the regulatory environment. That's absolutely right. You know, if they're not prepared to provide any guidance, then you shouldn't be penalizing people. But if they are providing guidance, then ultimately people need to be aware of that and, and make sure that they are abiding by those frameworks. Yeah, but even, you know, even though, you, I mean, we talked about, you know, tax um, legislation yep. a bit before as a classic example of how not to do something. The one thing that we did, which I just still to this day don't understand, is, is um, we allowed the introduction of retrospective legislation. Mm. So yeah. people who were actually conducting themselves in what they were, actually, they were conducting themselves in a perfectly law-abiding fashion with good faith, suddenly found themselves retrospectively legislated against and facing, mm. um, you know, facing, you know, the, the criminal prosecutions in the courts. I mean, it's completely dark. But I, th I thought the FCA said that they weren't going to be doing that. Well, I don't know. I'm just saying there's a precedent for it, isn't there? Sure. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I mean, you know, I've, 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 I know people who, you know, pretty much lost six years of their livelihoods fighting battles that ultimately were, were completely unjustified and, that, and, and actually had, had, had somebody had the common sense to go, look, right, here's the line, you know, here's, here's, here's the uh, line in the sand. Everything that's gone before that line in the sand, right, you know, 
we hold our hands up, we did bad legislation, get over it, yes, some bad actors get through, blah, 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 boom, done. Now, from his point, this point forward, you will go to jail. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't strike me as, 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 as being anything other than common sense. Mm. And I just, what I really, really hope is that, again, the, given the import of, the importance rather of, 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 of you know, blockchain and, and, and the ancillary technologies that um, go with that. I mean, if, when we talk about AI, you know, there's a fusion of you know, AI and blockchain to an extent as well. You know, if those are stifled and innovation is stifled because who's going to jail? You know, who am I going to sue? You know, and that's why I said that, you know, Bitcoin's in a bit of a unique, ex um, in a, in a unique position because you can't sue anyone and you can't send anyone to jail because you don't know who they are. Agreed. And as we state, I'm just curious, um, do you think that there's a looming economic crisis? And second part of that question <laughs> is, do you think cryptocurrencies could soften the blow of the crisis? You can take that one first. I know you're very tired. Oh, no, no, based on that, I'm just, I just, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just, I'm just rather caught short in, 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 on my birthday sort of holiday when um, I also fell on a bank holiday and the office said you have to write next week's newspaper for this week as well. I'm like, great, so there, there, there goes my holiday. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd write about I'd write about um, a, a vision of the future. It was quite you know apocalyptic. Let's put it that way. I mean, I, I sort of, sort of, you can imagine the 29th of March, 2021, that the, the um, uh, hard Brexit second anniversary, Trump just being re-elected, the bond markets were brutal, the corporate lending in America was unsustainable, everything's imploding. You know, real Armageddon stuff in 2021, by the way, you know, but, you know, and it's not far away, let's face it. Um, and I think a lot of, and actually on a serious note, a lot of, a lot of commentators are pointing at various cycles and things that all seem to, to, to gravitate towards somewhere between 2020 and 2022, Yes, that absolutely. kind of an area. Now look, I mean, you know, the, the, nothing's a foregone conclusion, obviously, but Assuming that does happen, the whole point of my little, you know, my little four hundred p word piece was to say, if it does happen, what will people do? And I think, I mean, the other comment that I made in the column was that, you know, come twenty twenty one, the the world population is seven point eight billion, and you know, there's a huge increase in the over sixty fives and you know, retirement age and all that kind of stuff. So you're talking about a bunch of people who. We'll, we'll, we'll follow what they learnt and knew from their own parents and their own experiences, and that tends to be go to something safe, like gold or you know uh, silver or some other precious commodity. Um, but the millennial generation, um, is it Generation Z? I don't know yeah. Which one are we on at the moment? Is it Generation Z? I'm not quite sure. But they, 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 they'll go. They'll go, um, you know, flying headlong towards crypto, perhaps, and 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 actually, if you confuse the two together, that's kind of a fun thing. Yeah. as an idea. But, yeah. I think it will soften the blow, but how about yourself? I think that uh, no one knows, no, first of, of all, but if you were to look at people's behaviour. Uh, you mentioned that people are actively looking at when this might happen. Mm. So it, to, to answer your question uh, clearly, uh, there, there's only so much global debt that can be around made out of nothing. Agreed, yeah. Right? That's the What if President Donald J. Trump decides, oh, sold that, I'm going to pay that $1.5 trillion. Well, then it goes into free fall. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> About the kind of adoption of it, people are actually looking at the correlations between, you know, the stock market movements and what crypto assets and cryptocurrencies do. Mm. And uh, the, to my knowledge, there's been no um, serious correlation that people can actually use yet that allows them to say, OK, this market movement from the traditional finance uh, space equaled or went into the crypto well, asset world. Well. I'm um, sorry to interrupt you, but I um I got a vague sort of memory of reading something that the 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 the, the uh, Bitcoin price um you know up, ups and downs pretty much correlated with Nasdaq. Well, people speculate on this. 
Well, I thought you were going to say Brexit, because when Brexit happened and the financial markets crashed, there was a 30% cause there was a drop in the UK currency, um, and there was a 30, 30 increase in the Bitcoin price, and people think that that was correlated. People okay. were moving their money from conventional into... I was, I was just this, talking about the, 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 the oh, actual okay. chart itself. If you, if, you, if you take the shape of the chart of Bitcoin and you know, put it against there's the NASDAQ, yeah, they're remarkably yeah. similar. There's, there's, a, there's a difference between I think and I know or can prove. Right and and people want to see what they want to see. Yeah. That's a human bias, right? Mm. We we actively want to see something that we want to see. So um, you know, there's so many unknowns that uh, we don't know about. So the unknown unknowns that feed into how the markets actually move, mm. especially in this nascent space. That you can try and correlate whatever you like to uh, to the market. Um, but no one has actually proved that that is correlated yet. Yeah. So, you know, it might come down to uh, people's perception of what uh, crypto assets provide. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, active uh, use of crypto assets. For instance, Bitcoin is being used in Venezuela at the yes. moment to uh, ensure that they can flee the country without having their uh, money and funds actually uh, confiscated. Mm. And that's a real world use that's happening at the moment that you could see if yeah, the, 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 yeah. the apocalypse actually does happen, mm. then uh, you know Bitcoin as a crypto asset and cryptocurrency that is truly decentralized and, and doesn't have a you know, face to the yeah. name mm -hmm. is, is an asset that could be useful in those situations because um, there are multiple ways to remember your private key to get into the actual uh, you know, currency. So you don't need to write it down. You might have it in different locations. Oh, I know. I've, I've, I've got to tell you something really funny. I've, 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 met, these, I've met these guys in Malta who, who have come up with um, uh, a, 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 a storage. I mean, it's really, really simple. It's made of solid titanium. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and they're two plates. Yeah. And you get a hammer... And, and some lesser things. So you put all, do all of your... I've seen that, actually. It's yes. absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, and, and you think, oh, where does it plug in? <laughs> it's just two plates, but it's just really cool. It doesn't yeah. get burnt in the fire. Oh, you store your private... You, you store yeah, you, your, you, you actually put your private keys on this thing. And you just put it into a titanium plate. And no, no, it, it is... The, the plate is Oh, right, titanium. yeah, right, right. right. So yeah. They, and, and I think they, I think they uh, put two matches in the box so that you can burn the private... <laughs> you, 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 your bit of paper once you've done it. <laughs> Which is great, but that can be uh, very easily attacked, right? It doesn't yeah. take much to bring two people together and, or get the, the plates. So it might be great from a, you know, well, this is fun. Cool. Know, yeah, great. Cool. Cool. But if you actually think about, you know, in a real world situation when you need to flee the country, how are you going to do that effectively and, and make sure that you don't have things confiscated? Mm -hmm. So when people look at the kind of, older methods of uh, fleeing to safety, mm -hmm. as in gold and other commodities, they can be transported physically, can't they? And that's actually something else I learned at that Spectator event. There was a, um, a, an authoress, um, Lionel Shriver, I don't know if I've got her name wrong, but she said in 19, I think it was in 1932 in the US, it was illegal to own gold. They, mm. Yeah, they yeah. confiscated it, right? So the, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a man. <laughs> it happened in the UK as well. Um, Alex, my boss, told me that it happened all around the world. So it was like the jaw drop. Yeah, it's, it's honestly astounding. So most people, when you say, "Open your mouth, please." Yeah, <laughs> but when you know you said that mm. um, people should invest in gold, and that's where people are going to go to. I think that cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin, is gold 2.0. It has the, uh, it has the, it has the characteristics of gold, but supersedes gold in many different ways. And the simple fact is that gold is still a very centralized commodity because there's custodians of gold. And often that gold is represented by paper certificates to say, you own this piece of gold and if you come to our door, you can claim it at any point. Well, what happened in 2008 was that all of these people went with their piece of paper to the vault and said, give me my gold. And there was a leverage of three pieces of paper to one gold bullion. And that's what shows to you that you aren't actually holding a solid asset in the, in the face of a financial crisis. But when you own your Bitcoin and you put it on your own private wallet, you own that. No one can touch that. No one can hack it. And that makes it more sound money and more of a... Well, first of all, it makes it more well, of a... Well, that, 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 that author... Um, sound money. Uh, he called it hard, hard money, didn't it? 
Yeah, well, some people call it sound money, some people call it hard money. But the point is that people, when they start learning, then this is what happened to me. I started learning about cryptocurrencies and I was like, oh, so this is new money. But what is old money? What, is, what, that, what actually constitutes the fiat system? And when you go to the core principles of the fiat system, you realize that it really is nothing but a tangle of nonsense. It's the, it's the command of the authority in society to tell you to accept this as money. And if you don't, you get put in prison. And because of that, people just accept it. They accept the authorities that be, and they go about their busy little lives, spending nine hours a day earning this thing that has actually no real value, the piece of paper, you could burn it. There's nothing back in that currency other than people with guns and jails that you'll be put in if you don't pay your taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what we, we, we teach people day in, day out about the philosophical, philosophical side of what this um, infrastructure that we are dealing with now mm. actually is. Because, uh, you know, stripping down um, what a currency is to its bare elements it is uh, supply demand as well as a promise to pay the bearer. That's mm. what it says on the notes. Pay the bearer, yes, yeah. uh, you know, £10, £20, £50, etc., or dollars, but effectively, uh, it, it's not worth the, the money it's actually, you know, paper that's written on. Mm. So, anything can be a currency. This glass could be a currency. If someone is willing to take it and then exchange something for it, it is a currency. But there are fundamental hallmarks of what a currency actually is. You know, it's a store of value, medium of exchange, um, and then the other part of it is that it's actually accepted, right? Mm -hmm. So th that can be anything, and we've used different things to, to represent a currency mm -hmm. for uh, millennia. So what's really interesting about crypto assets is the fact that they are digital, and uh, you don't need to physically move the assets around mm -hmm. anymore. You know, gold mm -hmm. is heavy. If you look at, for instance, um, the US trying to get the, the gold back from uh, Germany or the, the other way around, I can't remember if it was Germany trying to get the gold back from the US, they, they still have not completed that operation and, and transfer because of all of the different elements that actually combine together mm. to move gold. Mm. You need security. You need to make sure that it's all accurate. You need to have it checked. You then need to actually ship it physically. All of this stuff either adds up in cost or uh, risks of it being stolen, manipulated, etc. So then you look at how crypto assets and blockchain can provide to society in different ways and how we can exchange with each other. It becomes very powerful. But that's what we need to teach people about the ethos of it and how to, how to actually manage that. Mm. There's a term that I brought up with, there's a term that I want to coin, which I brought up in the interview with Roger Verne, which is neo-capitalism. Because capitalism, at its most fundamental, is the uh, division of labour into specialised parties, which trade with one another on an individual level and on a nation-state level to bring prosperity to the people involved in the trade, and it brings people together into communities. That was it. <laughs> I just don't say, you... you... You remember yeah, that one well. I've got a photographic <laughs> memory. <laughs> the wealth of nations by Adam Smith. And that's the basic premise of capitalism. But the problem is that within that trade, you have the person who's selling and the person who's buying. But when people own the money in the middle, then there's three parties in that transaction. And, and that money has its own self-interest. Mm. And that distorts the market at a very fundamental level. But when you have a neutral currency, like a cryptocurrency, decentralized currency, then you restore back into place the buyer and the seller. You install back in place efficient trade, and with that efficient trade brings about a, a more efficient version of capitalism and more prosperity. And that's why I want to term the that's why I want to coin the term neo capitalism because it encapsulates the basic model of the cryptocurrency model, which is take the centralized authorities out of control of the money and let the money do what money does best, and that bring prosperity and wealth to everybody. Which is a great way of putting it, but actually, is that going to happen? Because we started this conversation off with what is going to happen with the institutions mm. and how can they actually come into the space. Yes. And, it, you know, the utopia that you speak of is fantastic, but we are already seeing the representation of, of um, that utopia not happening because we have institutions coming in and we are inherently bringing the kind of centralization that we already have, but we're overlaying that with mm. crypto assets and digital assets and blockchain as a mm. technology. So... 
that's what interested me when I first got into this space. You know, the mm. ethos of what Bitcoin and mm. crypto assets brings and blockchain as a technology. Mm. But uh, if you look at the way that the market is actually moving and how humans are interacting with what we see as crypto assets and blockchain, uh, I'm not sure that we will get to that stage that we will actually have a fully decentralized ecosystem. We will still have you know, uh, third parties that we're going to need to rely on in some way. Yeah, I wonder why that is. I mean, you know, people, you know, the, the, the big talk, wasn't it, about blockchain to remove the middleman. Well, the middleman needs to pay his bills too. Yeah, you know, but I suppose and, the point and, and is get rid of him so then he doesn't need to pay his bills because he doesn't exist and then the market's not distorted by a middleman. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I think the, the fundamental principle of Bitcoin is still in place because I don't have an intermediary. I've not got anything to do with centralization because mm -hmm. I own my own Bitcoin. It's in my own safe. I can spend it as I want it. But yeah, the institutions are going to come in. And it's on the part of us, the people in the space, people involved in the crypto media, to point to the institutions that are trying to centralize these, these powers and simply educate the community not to use those facilities because those facilities are being corrupted by institutional money, by... Uh, by money grabbing and greed. And I think that the, the community is becoming much more educated very quickly. And, we, and it's the same, for example, when people start getting on the blockchain hype and IBM and all these companies start, and Microsoft doing all their blockchain, well, then people start to ask the question, is this an open or is this a closed blockchain? Mm. And if it's a closed blockchain, it's not really blockchain. And people now have that understanding. So people look at this and the first question they ask is, is this open or closed? If it's open, then it's decentralized. It's true to the nature of Satoshi's vision. And if it's closed, then it's not, and let's just not go near it. The same will happen with the cryptocurrency world, I believe. It just takes time. We are in the very, very infant stages at the moment. But as we evolve and as these conversations happen more widespread, I think people will get smarter. So do you back Roger Ver or do you back Craig Wright? Neither. <laughs> I back wow. Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi vision. <laughs> no, not Satoshi's vision. Oh, yeah, not that bad, man. Uh, so I just want to pick up on a point that you, you made there about, you know, uh, centralization and decentralization because um, that comes in many different smells, flavors, and tastes, yes. right? Um, ultimately, centralization can be seen as third parties that are managing um, assets and the currencies or, um, you know, the technology. Mm -hmm. But then there are different ways to ex extrapolate that because you might not need a bank or an institution to rely on actually accessing your money and doing something with it. But there is also centralization within the ecosystem in terms of, you know, the mining power, for instance. Yes, I agree. Right? Yeah, so yeah, that's I very agree. fundamental for people to understand. That it's not just this utopia of decentralized world, great, no. because we don't have institutions or, or banks in the middle or middlemen. We still have centralization in some shape or form. It's yeah. just the the perception of minimal viable decentralization or centralization mm -hmm. that is is yeah. important yeah i agree because but as we say this we are basically the infant stage and people all these different projects are all trying their various consensus mechanisms and whatever um proof of work has its problems with centralization of course uh, like eos's delegated proof of stake i think is a bit closer to what we should be aiming for but at the moment that proof of work does what it needs to do, which is to allow anyone anywhere to access a, a digital economy without having anyone uh, stop them at the door. Yes, it needs to be improved. I, um, I would happily admit that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have many hurdles to overcome. Centralization of mining power is one of them. But this is a hell of a good start. We're only 10 years in. We've got Goldman Sachs on side. We've got JP Morgan on side. We've got the regulators are now starting to soften up towards yeah. it. And to be fair, Bitcoin in that ten years, um, it's the exchanges that have been hacked, but the the, yeah. the, 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 the actual nature of it. I mean, the the algorithms and all that because have never been compromised as yet. Yeah, I, I was told that well, I've heard from a few people that Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain, is the most secure piece of software ever devised by humanity, hands down. What about that bug thing? Yeah, but it didn't, it didn't break the network and no one stole funds. So there's obviously... Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. Like to, to be able to protect this, like, billions upon billions from every hacker in the world being able to access it, that's phenomenal. Yeah. And anyway, chaps, it's been great having you on, and I'm sure we'll do it again soon. Mm -hmm. But let's end it there. Pleasure, thank yeah. you. Great, thank you. Yeah, enjoy it. All right. Thank you. Cool. Nailed it. Done. Thanks for watching.